This is a thinking of playing video of uh, crossbows and cannon. Crossbows and Cannon was published in 1992, designed by Robert Markham, published by 3W. This is part of the 3W Royalston Roundheads system. Um, it includes four battles, the battles of uh, Pavia in 1525, Grigliano 1503, Ravenna in 1512, and Bicoca in 1522. Weapons in the game range from arquebuses, crossbows, cannon, pike, and more. Units include stradiots, genitors, pikemen, and more. Uh, there was a crossbows and cannon volume 2 that was also published later. On Board Game Geek it has a, a solidly below average uh, rating of 5.61. So as a general preview, I'm going to go ahead and read um, some of the user comments on Board Game Geek. So this is the part of the game page where you can read um, both the, the numerical ratings and comments um, of users. So the scale is 1 to 10. Um, as I usually do, I've gone ahead and reversed the ranking, so I'm starting at the bottom. And I'm going to skip a few uh, very short or very unhelpful comments. Uh, so again, I'm starting at the bottom. So there's a, a rating of 2. Again, ratings 1 to 10. So there's a 2 rating. Um, this uh, user mentions uh, too many things didn't seem right. Uh, the worst being Superman skirmishers who would slaughter all and run away unscathed. Um, there is a uh, a uh, a four rating would have been a decent series on an undergamed topic if not for the rifle armed skirmishers. Some oddities with hand to hand combat as well. Um, there is a a five rating. Usually, one should avoid war games by three W. But this is actually one of the better games. Rob Markham's combat system is very good and has been adopted by many other designers in their games lately. So lately, this is uh, this comment was posted in 2005. Um, uh, there's another 5 rating, and this comment is one fun thing about this game. The varied route conditions rolls did not allow you to plan exactly when you were going to lose. Um, I think I know the rule that uh, is being referred to here. Um, let's see if I can quickly summarize it. So under the rules, um, under the victory conditions, rule section 11. Um, okay, uh, each scenario lists the number of combat strength points a side may lose before the opponent begins checking for victory. To count losses, the player totals the strength points of eliminated units by using the front or stronger side combat strength of the unit. To this is added three points for each leader eliminated and five points for an overall leader that is eliminated. Combat units on the board on their reduced side subtract the reduced combat strength from the full combat strength and the difference counts for victory conditions. The full combat strength of currently routed units is also added. Um, units which have routed off the map are counted as eliminated for victory point purposes. So starting with turn 5, in any turn in which the loss has reached the indicated level, what's meant here is that there are specific victory tables for each scenario and each side. Yeah, there's a table for each side in each scenario. And these are basically ranges of strength point losses and for each range of, of uh, strength point losses given, there is a die roll needed for victory on a 10-sided uh, die. Um, so uh, the opponent, so starting with turn 5, in any turn in which the losses reach the indicated level, the opponent checks for victory. This is a, a kind of sudden death victory check, okay? By rolling one die and comparing the result uh, to the scenario's victory table. This continues until the end of the game is reached or the die reached or the die roll has yielded a victory. 
So the scenario still have a maximum number of turns given, but with this uh, die roll keyed to um, strength point losses, you can have a sudden death uh, end earlier than the overall turn limit of the scenario. Um, so I won't finish the the rest of the uh, the rules section, but I think that's what this poster is referring to. And in my experience of playing various games in the Royals and Roundhead series, I like this a lot, and I hope to show again in this playing um, uh, how that rule actually works. Um, there is a uh, there's a six rating. And the, the comment is, would have rated higher, would have rated higher, but for errata. Yes, um, as a matter of fact, um, before I chose the battle that I did uh, for this play, the first battle I chose actually had units um, that were, let me see, they were, the units are cavalry, but they have infantry silhouettes on them. Um, so I scrapped that scenario. So I started setting up Ravenna and I in, of course I was almost done setting it up when I found this mistake. Uh, these two cavalry units have infantry silhouettes on them. So I decided since th this is the first time I'm playing the first, um, this first volume, this volume one of Crossbows and Cannon, very first time I'm playing this, I thought, eh, I don't think I want to start with a game that has, you know, incorrect silhouettes. Um, so I packed up Ravenna, and then I switched to Bicoca, which is the battle that I'm thinking of playing here. Uh, so, yes, there is some serious errata, and it includes actually miss, you know, incorrect silhouettes on game pieces. So pretty, pretty significant errata. And I know, I know there's other errata as well. So, um, yeah. Um, there's a, a seven rating that notes, um, even though it has some nice ideas, there's also a lot of die rolling, um, different battles never before gamed. Um, yeah. Um, there's another seven rating, one of my favorite games. Wow. Fast and easy to play with a very intensive gameplay and, and good historicity. That's good. I mean, that's a good, uh, recommendation. There's another seven. I was very excited to get this. It has very few games available on the period. So we're talking early 16th century here. Uh, less so after playing. The system does not catch warfare of the period. Cavalry is not powerful enough in this system to recreate its role at the time. That said, games are easy and fun and could be a nice way to introduce someone to Renaissance warfare. All right, does it, and finally, the highest rating the game gets is, is a 7.5. Um, comments are heavy dice rolling. Battles are really shorter than 24 turns, so you cannot so you cannot be annoyed. Um, strong luck factor. Um, high replayability, decent components. Some minor doubts about rules. Yes, abs absolutely. Um, very loose, very loose. Rules writing makes you really wonder whether you're playing the rules exactly correct or whether you're missing something really important. All right, so, uh, and finally, uh, this comment concludes with, we enjoyed it and hope you will too. Uh, all right, that's, those are really all of the um, helpful comments on Board Game Geek. So, uh, crossbows and cannon. So, um, as a way of background, um, after choosing to start with Bicoca, the Battle of Bicoca here um, in uh, Crossbows and Cannon, um, went ahead and uh, looked to see what uh, Hans Delbruck uh, said about the battle or how it um, uh, how it even shows up in History of the Art of War. Um, it is mentioned at the very, very end of Volume 3, Medieval Warfare. And before jumping up and seeing if it's mentioned at the beginning of Volume 4, um, 
I just stuck with volume three here because um, when I was when I was look when I was reading about the material when I was reading the material around the Battle of Bicoca, um, I figured that uh, the conclusion, the concluding chapter to this volume, Medieval Warfare, uh, I think is going to make a great general historical background. So I'm going to go through and um, read through most, if not all, of the concluding chapter here uh, to Volume 3 in the History of the Art of War, this volume titled Medieval Warfare by Hans Delbruck. So while this um, reading introduction to Battle by Coca uh, as, a, as a game here is not, uh, is not directly about the battle, I think this, this chapter will give a uh, kind of a broad, uh, well, it'll get me in the mental um, space of, of combat, of warfare at this uh, time period. So in the Middle Ages, the disciplined legions of antiquity had been replaced by a warriorhood based entirely on the bravery and skill of the individual. At the same time that the tactical bodies of antiquity were breaking up, the specialized combat branches with their opposite characteristics disappeared as they blended into one another. The elite individual sol uh, soldier or warrior fought on horseback or on foot and used spear, sword, and bow alternately and as circumstances required. The combat branches, which gradually became distinct again in the Middle Ages, sprang from a process of differentiation. As the summit of individual warriorhood, there developed on the one side the very heavily armored and mounted knight on an armored horse, and on the other side, as a result of the one-sided and inflexible nature of that arm, all kinds of secondary arms on horseback and on foot, which did not rise above the role of simple support troops and did not develop independence. The dismounted spearmen in particular could not hold their own against knights in the open field. They would be broken up by the attack of knights who were supported where necessary by marksmen and they were without offensive power. Marksmen too, alone in the open field, were no match for attacking knights. These knights and foot soldiers were not what we call cavalry and infantry. Despite the great similarity of their armament, they were basically different in spirit, actions, and concept. Let us look first at the foot soldiers armed with close combat weapons. The difference between a group of medieval spearmen and a phalanx, legion, or cohort is that it formed no tactical body, that is, a formation in which a mass of warriors is joined into a force with a unified will. Only foot troops organized in this way can be designated as infantry. The test is combat against mounted men in the open field. With the help of a wagon fort, the Hussites succeeded with their foot troops in standing up to knightly armies. But this was only an episode. The wagon fort was much too cumbersome to fill the overall needs of the conduct of war. The Hussite method of warfare did not have any kind of lasting effect. A true infantry was not formed again until the period of the Swiss dominance, with the battles of Laupen and Sempach, Granson, Merton, and Nancy, we once again have foot troops comparable to the phalanx and to the legions. A series of factors coincided to create the new skill and power in this part of the German Alpine areas. Mountainous terrain is inherently favorable for maintaining pristine warrior strength. The dissolution of the Duchy of Swabia with the fall of its Duckel family, the Hohenstaufens, and the extinction of the great house of Zeringen caused the appearance in that region of the innumerable small areas directly subordinate to the empire, which, like the small Greek cantons centuries earlier, developed and exercised their military strength in continuing combat with one another. The nature of the mountainous terrain also gave communities of peasants and burghers the possibility from the start, through ingenious exploitation of the terrain, to meet and defeat knightly armies. In these battles, they developed the appropriate weapons and formations, first the throwing of stones in the halberd, and then the long spear, which several successive ranks could extend forward and thus prevent knights from penetrating into the formation. Scholars have differed as to when the long spear was introduced and have even disputed its invention by the Swiss, claiming it was not a peasant weapon, but one appropriate for city dwellers. This question cannot be answered so directly, and it is also not so very important. Long spears were already mentioned among the weapons of the early Germans. 
Then again among the Quadi and the Sarmatians, among the Saxons, and in Italy. Individual soldiers in all periods may have chosen longer spears in order to hold the enemy farther away from them, while others may have preferred shorter spears in order to be able to handle them better. The very long spear, more than 20 feet, is very uncomfortable to carry and can be used for nothing else than for combat in close formation, particularly not even for hunting. The attacks of heavy knights could also be repelled with spears 10 and 12 feet long if the mass only remained tightly closed. It is therefore not necessary to assume that the Swiss peasantry was already using long spears at Morgarten or even earlier. It was not until battles of this kind were fought repeatedly and it was realized how decisively important it was to be able to repel horsemen that the transition could have been made to placing men with the longest possible spears in the exterior ranks of the square. The experience at Laupen was well suited to give birth to the idea that in the future they would hold their own better with lengthened spears. But whether these spears were used at Sempach is not clear either from the events of the battle or the sources. Recently, the presumption has been advanced that the very long spears were not adopted until after the Burgundian Wars. The use of the shield is not compatible with either the halberd or the long spear, since each of those weapons is manipulated with both hands, and the men armed with halberds do not wear any armor. They are protected through the fact that they form the interior ranks and files of the square. It was not until the closed mass had gained the pressure advantage, thrown the enemy back, broken its own close formation, and started pursuing that the work of the halberdiers started and they then needed no significant protective armor since the enemy's real strength was already broken. But the spearmen, who formed the exterior ranks of the square in order to repulse the knights and drive forward to push them back, were also provided with armor and helmet in order to be protected not only against the lances and swords of the knights, but also against the arrows, bolts, and bullets of the enemy marksmen. Spear and armor go together so naturally that no special mention was made of the spear together with the harness, but it was taken for granted. The marksmen moved along beside the square, skirmishing out and then pushing back into the square when pressed. The larger a closed square is, the less likely it can be broken up by horsemen and the more strongly it can push forward. But it is still not advisable to place all troops in one square because such a mass can quite easily be stopped by an attack from two directions, as happened to the troops of the forest cantons at Laupen and then the unit becomes helpless. And so the Swiss developed their method of always forming in three large squares, regardless of the size of their army, so that they could mutually support one another. These three squares were formed neither in a straight column nor directly side by side, but in staggered echelons, so that they did not interfere with one another. The one to the rear, entering the fight somewhat later than the one in front of it, maintained a certain freedom of maneuver up to the last moment. Even a very large square of, say, 10,000 men has great flexibility of movement because of the narrowness of its front, only 100 men, and it is not until the 15th century that this formation in three squares can be definitively proven. At Morgarten and Sempach, only two squares specifically appear in the battle, one maintaining a defensive stance and the other making the flanking attack. But it is not impossible that there was also a third square present And since this unit actually did appear at Laupen, we may assume that this division into three units probably was already normal in the 14th century. Possessing appropriate weapons, the most suitable battle formations and experienced leaders who understand how to exploit the advantages of the mountain mountain terrain, the peasants and burghers developed a sense of confidence that turned the entire people into a warriorhood. Even today, Swiss patriotism has difficult Uh, has difficulty tearing itself away, not only from the William Tell and Winkelried legends, but also from the idea that their ancestors were an innocent people of pious shepherds who only became warlike as they defended their freedom against foreign tyrants, first the Habsburgs and then the Duke of Burgundy, both of whom were seen as leading huge masses against the small nation. Every bit of historical consistency is eliminated by these concepts, and every possibility of understanding is suppressed. Of course, the popular concept can hardly work in any other way than with such pictures. We have already seen this point among the Greeks, who did not know how to express the fame of their Persian wars in any other way than by the victory of a small minority over a superior force of countless numbers. 
In both cases, scholarship must correct those kinds of ideas, and in doing so, it takes nothing from the fame of the heroic deeds of the peoples, but simply transposes that fame into another sphere. The warriorhood of the Swiss had the same plundering and forcefully cruel trade as the Germans of early times. The Swiss communities, as soon as their success was inject, had injected self-confidence into the masses and in their immediate area, where there was no problem of obtaining provisions, were able to put into the field superior numbers, even against the strongest medieval army. For knightly armies, even with their serving men and mercenaries, were by their very nature always small. From Morgarten to Nancy, the armies of the Confederation were always considerably larger than those of their enemies, at times as high as double their strength. It was only as a result of this that they were able to develop their gigantic power. The individual elements of their strength increased to the utmost, whereas everywhere else in Europe only a small part of the population entered the warriorhood in the Swabian Alpine areas, the closeness to nature, success, and the training of the entire body of men lent the character and the readiness of professional warriorhood, and the masses that could now be called into service redoubled their confidence and their certainty of being victorious. The national leadership intentionally saw to it that they were preceded by a reputation that struck terror into their enemies. Whereas in European professional warriorhood, among knights as well as mercenaries, a certain tendency toward mutual mercy, mercy had, been, uh, had taken hold, and men were satisfied with the taking of prisoners in cases where killing did not seem absolutely necessary, the Swiss, for their part, from the very start, struck down every man they could reach. They were expressly forbidden to take prisoners, and any prisoners taken were killed later. Even when in the civil war between the members of the Confederation themselves, the old Zurich War, troops of the forest cantons, along with the Bernese and other cantons, captured the castle of Greifensee, they had the garrison of Zurich troops, who had had to surrender at the mercilessness of their enemy, executed. This was in 1444. The savage bloodthirstiness with which all the burghers in the peaceful town of Steffi were killed presumably evoked some reproach within the Confederation itself, but it was, after all, only the usual application of the principle that in battle no man might be spared. It is reported as a mitigating factor when young boys, quote-unquote, were spared. In the first general military regulations of the Confederation, the Sempach letter of 1393, it had to be expressly prescribed that since the well-being of all men was re renewed and expanded by the concept of women, wives and daughters were not to be struck, stabbed, or mistreated. The strongest reason for this severity in the conduct of war was the danger that plundering and the taking of prisoners created for the military action itself. The Sempach letter was drawn up in consideration of the fact that in the battle, many more of the enemy could have been killed if the victors had not been so very anxious to seize booty immediately. But by going to such an extreme of a as absolutely forbidding the taking of prisoners, they increased the fear in the enemy camp. The panic that broke out in the Austrian rearguard at Sempach and in the Burgundian army at Granson and Merton, as soon as there was an unfavorable turn in the battle, or even the appearance of such a turn, may also be considered to have been an after-effect of the well-known custom of the Swiss to grant no mercy. Charles the Bold, as his troops were marching out of Nancy against the Swiss, made a speech to his captains, saying that the enemies, according to their custom, would immediately form for battle at the border. If they were defeated, he went on to say, and suffered even only a small reverse, they would be broken and lost from that point on. Somewhat exaggerated in its form, this statement was still correct in its concept. That is, the bravery of the Swiss arose from their success, while their success gave them confidence in their unstoppable assault, before which the loosely knit squares of the enemy armies disintegrated, no matter how much personal bravery still existed in the individual knights or mercenaries. We can compare the Swiss of this period with the Athenians of the Age of Pericles, just as we have compared them with the early Germans. The inhabitants of the peninsula of Attica were not by their nature braver or more skilled in naval matters than the other Greeks. The march of historical development and politics, however, had formed the entire population into a warriorhood on land and on sea, and this gave them, in their civic life, important characteristics of professional soldiery. That was held up to them by their general, Nicias, when he addressed them before the battle against the Syracusans. The latter, he said, were a simple people's levy, 
whereas his own troops were selected men who understood war. There is also between the Swiss and the other Germans not a distinction of race, but of historical development and political training. Most of the Habsburg warriors were just as good, Sw uh, were just as good Swiss as the men of the forest cantons. The victors of Granson and Merton were in great part the defeated of Morgarten, Laupen, and Sempach. These defeated men, by entering partly voluntarily and partly through force into the circle of victors, also assumed their characteristics. The squares of the Swiss risked moving forward offensively as foot troops against knightly armies and even storming fortified positions. That was something completely new since the decline of antiquity and the rise of the feudal military organization. As late as 1475, at the beginning of the Burgundian War, on the occasion of a withdrawal out of Franche-Comte, uh, Comte, the foot troops of the Confederation protected themselves against Burgundian knights by forming a wagon fort. Never again do we hear of this kind of action. Once again there was a body of foot troops that was not simply a supporting arm for the knights and that risked fighting against knights. Not simply when supported by entrenchments, but with complete confidence in its own power, accepted any kind of battle with any enemy. The formation, the tactical body of the square, the weapons, the long spear and the halberd, the mass of men resulting from the people's levy, and the warlike spirit nurtured and developed in continuing battles all worked effectively together. When the French mercenaries, the Armagnacs, threatened to make their incursion into Switzerland in 1444, a body of 1,500 men with rash courage took up the fight with them at St. Jacob on the Beers in the vicinity of Basel, uh, although the battle ended with their complete destruction, they had fought it through with such courage that even their enemies were filled with admiration. Swiss mercenaries were highly esteemed and recruited by the peoples on all sides. The victories over Charles the Bold, even though, of course, chance and the errors of the Burgundian leaders had played a large role in them, gave the final and highest boost to the belief in Swiss competence and to the self-confidence of the Confederation. No longer considered as simple soldiers of fortune among other mercenaries, but as a unique and completely new military power, the men of the Confederation marched out of their mountains and won the victory at Nancy. This victory was not to remain an isolated episode, such as the victory of the Flemish at Courtrai. It opened access to a new epoch in the history of the art of war. The Middle Ages in military history already came to a close on the day of Merton, where, in the person of the Duke of Burgundy and his army, medieval methods of war were theoretically overcome, not by chance, not in a moment of weakness, not in a condition of decay, but on the contrary, at the highest imaginable degree of their perfection, and even especially supported by the new discovery of firearms. It can be assumed that a better general than Duke Charles would have made the victory much more difficult for the Swiss. But we may also conclude as a certainty that the Swiss would still have been victorious in the end, for no marksmen with bows, crossbows, and culverins were sufficient to hold up the attack of these huge aggressive squares with spears and hal halberds, which their captains skillfully led through the favorable areas of the terrain, and no body of knights was capable of breaking them up or of halting all three at the same time by flank attacks. Marksmen alone cannot stand fast against close combat weapons, and knights alone do not have any tactical leadership to enable them to paralyze the squares with coordinated maneuvers. The Swiss infantry formed, a tact formed tactical bodies, while the knights, marksmen, and spearmen of the Middle Ages did not have them. The Swiss had not only defensive and offensive power, but also leadership. With the Flemish too, 100 years earlier, a start was made in this direction. But as Rosbeck showed, this strength was not yet sufficient. The Confederation of the Mountain Cantons had for 150 years developed and confirmed its strength in a gradual progression. This force had now definitely conquered, and moving out of the mountains, it was to transform methods of warfare in all of Europe. We are now at a point of departure for new developments similar to that at the Battle of Marathon. As in the Persian Wars, the foot troops with close combat weapons had been victorious in the Burgundian Wars over the army of knights and marksmen. This victory necessarily had to transform everything. For the methods of warfare of a period uh, form a unity and a significant change in one spot reacts on all other parts. We have recognized as a natural complement of knighthood the fact that the period had no infantry, but only soldiers on foot. 
Now these foot soldiers have become infantry, and soon that would be the case everywhere. Then knighthood would also necessarily become cavalry.